This is my sixth undertaking dealing with the topic of divorce, remarriage, adultery. Decided to do something different for this one. I'm going to try to record voice instead of pinning a work. The last ones I had written. This one I'm going to deal with rule. Rule. Before I begin, I need to establish what I like to call irrefutable proof. Let me blow this up in case you're trying to watch it on a phone. Irrefutable proof. First, Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So you, there will be no excuse. We have his written word of the things that he has spoken. And no matter how man twists it or perverts it, it's still written plainly for you to see. And those words are words that will judge you so you can get mad at someone for telling you what the word says for speaking the truth of the word but what you can't do is say that it wasn't there that that God didn't provide his word plainly for you to see and it's that word that'll judge you in the last day so the irrefutable proof I think I have five passages here talking about a div divorce and remarriage adultery and they are plain I mean irrefutable there's no gray area here in Mark 10 verses 11 and 12 Jesus says whosoever and that's whosoever doesn't matter there's no distinction in marriages in the Bible okay so whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Now that's plain for the woman and the man, the husband and the wife. If you do this, you're committing adultery. Luke 16 and 18, Jesus says, Again, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. It's plain. Romans 7, verses 2 through 3. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loose from the law of her husband so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man so you can see here that if a woman is married to another man and still has a living husband She's considered to be an adulteress. And in, and in case, you know, you're one of those men out there that says, well, this is just talking about the woman. Well, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 27, it says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So if you're bound, stay bound. If you're divorced, if you're loosed, seek not to get remarried. It's plain talk in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. I mean, the Lord commands this. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. 
So if you do divorce, you're to remain unmarried or be reconciled. What you can't do is remarry. There's no verse in the Bible that allows remarriage. Okay? This, it's not in there. There's no gray area in these scriptures, and there is no scripture in the Bible that contradicts what these say. No matter the excuse that man rests out of the scripture, none of them contradict this. Well, what I want to focus on here is in Genesis 3.16. Where after the fall of man, God is speaking to the woman and he says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception In sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. And right here's what I'm looking at the rule. He, he shall rule over thee, the husband and notice husband is singular. going to talk about what is marriage because many people think that marriage is ceremony it's not ceremony in God's eyes the ceremony solemnizes the marriage it proves that you're not fornicators but the ceremony is not what God recognizes as the marriage so if you're out there and you're living single and you're just fornicating with someone, that's still a marriage in God's eyes. He doesn't, he doesn't recognize the ceremony. The ceremony only solemnizes it. Okay. Here in Matthew 19, 6, Jesus says, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. This is... What God recognizes as the marriage, what he has joined together. What did he join together? Well, when you come together with, when a man and a woman come together, and they're the only ones that can join together, by the way. They're the only ones that can become one flesh because they're the only ones that have the sexual organs that are, were created by God for this unitive joining for purposes of God's design to procreate, to be fruitful and multiply. That is the joining that God recognizes as a marriage. In Genesis 2, this is where God institutes the marriage covenant and Jesus refers back to this marriage covenant in Genesis when he's and basically repeats it in Mark chapter 10 verses 6 through 9 and you'll notice that Mark chapter 10 verses 6 through 9 precede Mark chapter 10 verses 11 through 12 where Jesus is saying that if you divorce and remarry you're committing adultery so this is right in line with those verses but from the beginning of the creation of God made them God made them male and female you see that male female for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Only this male and female can become one flesh, the unitive joining. People who are claimed to be, you know, marrying in these in today what they call same sex marriages, that's not a marriage in God's eyes. He doesn't recognize it. It's impossible for for same-sex couples to complete a unitive joining 
that's it doesn't work it's like the wrong plumbing you see that that's just another lie of the devil and the world that has deceived these people and they twain shall be one flesh so then they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder so this is what God recognizes as a marriage it's not the ceremony you had in a big church somewhere and saying hey we're married no it it was the joining of the flesh why is fornication such an evil sin because it's a marriage it's a marriage you say no it's not yes it is the Bible says it is right here is Paul talking in first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16 he says what know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body for two saith he shall be one flesh I mean here's someone that's just going out and paying for a prostitute to fornicate and Paul is saying that they're one flesh so when you come together with someone and most people today before they went through the ceremony of marriage have fornicated in this nation every time you did that you were in effect creating a marriage in God's eyes why is it considered fornication because you never solemnized it and neither one of you agreed that it was a marriage so it's it's fornication it's just as bad as adultery or homosexuality it's an evil sin you need to repent of it if you're married now and you fornicated with other people before your marriage you still need to confess those things to God because they're open doors to the devil and your flesh to tempt you because what you did was you created a soul tie with that person God designed it that way when you're joining together and becoming one flesh you, you became one flesh with that person you need to break that soul tie you need to confess it now why is fornication not considered one of your first marriages like when you were just fornicating instead of the one that you solemnized because of the witness system there has to be two witnesses and and you can't witness against yourself or witness against one person in Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 says one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established so when you you get married there has to be well to solemnize a marriage there has to be witnesses even if you elope or run off to the courthouse you have to have two witnesses this is what solemnizes the marriage this is you telling people testifying that hey this is legit we're not fornicators anymore we're married this is lawful what's unlawful is when you're not married and you're just fornicating see it's not solemnized there's no you're not everybody seeing it and say and they can attest to it to say that well they're they don't have a solemnized union that guy's just a fornicator or that woman's just a fornicator and that's evil the judgment I want to talk about judgment because when you when we die physically there's gonna be some sort of judgment what it is gonna be exactly is hard to say I mean there's a lot of scripture talking about the judgment and there's a lot of confusion out there on it and a lot of different doctrines that I do not agree with and I'll point out where I don't agree with it but 
right here in Hebrews 9, it says that it, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So we're going to die and there's going to be a judgment for the things that you've done in this world. One of those examples is in Luke where the beggar Lazarus died it says and it came to pass that the beggar died and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he the rich man lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom so here two people died and one was carried into Abraham's bosom the beggar and the rich man ended up in hell now, it doesn't specifically say that there was some sort of judgment, but something did occur. Some determination was made that sent the beggar to Abraham's bosom and the rich man to hell. So there's going to be a determination, a judgment following your physical death that determines where you're going to go. And that's the bottom line when it comes to judgment that we need to retain. That when we pass, we're going to be judged for the things that we've done. And from that, a determination is going to be made to where we go. All right. Now, of the many types of judgment that are mentioned in the Bible, there are a lot of doctrines surrounding or not a lot of interpretations surrounding those doctrines that I don't know that I really agree with. I can see some of the point, but, you know, I think that you're giving people a false sense of security in the way some of them are brought, brought across. All right. There's going to be a judgment at Christ's return. It says that, you know, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And when he is on this throne, the nations are going to be gathered before him and he's going to divide the sheep and the goats. There's the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. These are examples of a separation. And in this separation... Here Jesus tells them that those that are blessed of my father, the sheep, shall in, that they're going to inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. All right. And then he tells the goats, the ones on his left hands, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So again, here is a type of a judgment where... People are separated and some go into heaven, some go into hell. And that's pretty much the theme when it comes to judgment. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, this is one of them that I think is perverted in the church because preachers and teachers, they tell people that, well, you're saved, which is, you know, you're not saved until you're saved, until you get there. I'm not trying to, to beat down your security in the Lord. If you're walking with the Lord and you're fellowshipping with the Lord, he's speaking to you and you're speaking to him and, and you know that he is in him, you have security. But what is going on is that there's people that are just religious people that ha just have a superstitious belief in the church. And the church is telling people, well, you've confessed Christ. You're saved. Um, you can't lose your salvation. Well, yes, you can. I mean, you can choose not to follow God. You can choose not to, to live according to his will. And what they're telling people is that, you know, giving them this false grace message where, oh, you're, everything's, no matter what you do, you can't lose your salvation. And people are out there living in, in sin, just like with uh, divorce, remarriage, adultery. You see, they have, they have uh, so whispered in the ears of these people, these sweet words saying, well, you're fine, you're saved. No, this isn't a sin that these people have bought it. And they're not living for God. Because if they were living for God, 
wholeheartedly with all their mind, you know, all their soul, all their strength, they would come out of these unholy marriages. But see, the unholy marriage means more to them than God. So they want to feel secure in their salvation or in the salvation the church is selling them instead of the true salvation that God is trying to give them, which is salvation from your sins. So that's why Jesus came. His sacrifice was needed to spill that blood to save you from your sins. See, when you die, there's no more blood sacrifice. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why you have to apply the blood now. You have to confess and forsake those sins now while the sacrifice is available to you. So if you stay in your sin, you know, if you willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice for sin. That's in Hebrews, I believe, chapter 10. But the judgment seat of Christ, this is being brought across in a way that tells people that, well, at the judgment seat of Christ, this is the judgment for believers. I don't know that you can get that determination from this passage rock solidly it's more of an assumption but they're telling people that you know all you'll lose you might lose some reward or, or receive some punishment but you cannot lose your salvation well that's not mentioned anywhere in here see they've they've extrapolated this from this passage telling people that well you're not going to lose any you lose your salvation at the judgment seat of Christ because your salvation is secured. You're just not going to get as much reward or, or you're going to get punished or something like that. I don't see that in this, but this is how it's being taught. So if you look at the verses, it says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. So at this judgment seat, what jumps out at me is it says we must all appear. Now they're saying it's just the believers. I guess to them, it's just all the believers. But again, you cannot pull from these passages that this is just a judgment of believers. That's something they add to it. And that if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation at this judgment. That's something else they add. Now, you can't, you can't find that in there. It's been added to it with the, the doctrines of of devils that they teach now in churches. So what jumps out is that all appear, everyone may receive, everyone may receive the things done in his body. So it's everyone again. See? And also with this judgment, it has this element of good and bad. So what you're telling me is that, that if this is just the believer's judgment and they're not going to lose any salvation, that there are going to be there are going to be people there of these every one people of these all people that are going to that have done good or bad things. To me, I don't see where light and dark can dwell together. And then in the next verse, it says, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. What terror is it in the way you're teaching it? So I'm going to lose some reward. So I'm going to lose, maybe get a little punishment, but I'm still going to live in eternity. I'm, I'm fine with that. Why not live for the pleasures of the world, you know, and just have this mental ascent of faith that you're selling and, you know, enjoy my life here because, you know, I can't lose this salvation that, that you're selling that, that allows me to still willfully sin and, you know, be in my second, third or fourth marriage. Why not do that? Because you say, I can't lose it at this judgment. I don't see that. I mean, the good and bad element, the terror of the Lord, and why Paul is going all out to say, we persuade men. You know, he, he's trying to be manifest in their conscience to fear this. So that's what I disagree with when it comes to the judgment seat of 
of Christ. And then, you know, later on down here, well, what is a true believer? Because that's what they're saying about the judgment seat of Christ, that if you're a believer, you're not, you're not going to lose your salvation. Here is Jesus talking about some talking about some people that thought that they were believers. And Matthew 7 says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You have to do God's will. His will is plain through the Bible. I mean, there, there are things that he commands, says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those are his will. Just like those commandments that say, you know, if you're involved in this divorce and remarriage adultery, that's a sin and that's against God's will. Many will say to me in that day, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? So these are obviously some type of believers. And, and Jesus is going to tell them, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And here's what gives you the security of being at ease with departing and being with the Lord. Him knowing you. And it's two way. Do you know him? Does he know you? Have you heard him speaking to you? Do you have that intimacy? See, most people don't have that. They just have church fellowship and and have a uh, a a taught faith of God. They might have had an experience where you know you know Jesus did come to them and you know pricked at their hearts, tried to get them to change or something, but then they fell back into a, a life of sin. When you do that, he doesn't know you anymore. I'm not going to read this right here, but in Hebrews, here is some examples of people um, that had faith. The whole chapter, you should read the whole chapter. But these people are basically, shows you, I mean, some of them were stone, cruel mockings of scourgings, bonds of imprisonment. You see that? Sown asunder. I mean, Isaiah, he was sown in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. You see that? Wandered in sheepskin, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented. In this world, you're going to suffer if you're a true believer in God. It's not going to be that, that nice little worldly life you have. If you speak truth, if you stand on God, if you're walking with God, you're going to go through these kind of cruel mockings. And you're going to be despised by the world. The great white throne judgment. This in the church, this is taught that this is a judgment of unbelievers. Again, I don't agree with that. I don't I don't see a lot of it's made on assumptions. They're reading things into it. I'm not going to read all of it, but right here in verse 12, it says that the books were opened and another book, which is the book of life. So at this great white throne judgment which most in the church teach that this is only unbelievers there's this book of life and in it people are going to be judged for their works okay and it says in verse 15 whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire since we're so fond of making assumptions why not make one here where it says, and whosoever was not found written in the book. We could assume that maybe some of them were found that was written there. So who's to say that this is just unbelievers? A lot of these are assumptions when it comes to the judgment. And I came to this conclusion, Jesus' own words when it comes to judgment, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. All right. You need to be striving, fellowshipping, doing whatever it takes to walk with the Lord daily, daily. Not living in the pleasures of the world, not walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit. Mortifying the deeds of the flesh. You need to be striving to enter in. 
I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about a fellowship, a walking with with God to where you're being conformed to the image of Christ more and more every day, every day, doing whatever it takes. Because if you're just feeding your flesh and living after the flesh, you're going to die. You need to read Romans 8. You will die. If you live after the flesh, you are going to die. Here's some more in that same chapter where it says uh, some of them are knocking on the door after he shut the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not. I know you not whence you are. See that? And they're even telling him, hey, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence. Probably at the church potluck. And thou hast taught in our streets. And he's going to tell them, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye that workers of iniquity. And this is the key here. If you're practicing sin, if you're committing sin willfully, the Lord doesn't know you. You don't know him. You don't know him. If you're willfully sinning, you do not know the Lord. And I don't care what you know, church is 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 blowing that love, grace, false love, grace message at you and saying God loves you no matter what you do. You can be you can still be sinning. No, he doesn't know you. He came to save you from your sins, not so you could practice sin. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom, and you yourselves thrust out. Why? Because you lived for yourself. You lived for yourself. And here again in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. If you're workers of iniquity committing these sins, you're not going to inher inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care what that man tells you. He hadn't been there. All he's interested in is you coming to church, giving him your money, and, you know, following the things that he tells you. He doesn't want you thinking critically or reading the Bible. That's why there's so many perverted English translations of the Bible out there today. Because they don't want you to really understand it. They just want you to come and listen to them, giving them the money. Because they're, they're the ones ruling in the vineyard today. Now back to this rule. Where the husband, he shall rule over thee. There's a hierarchy there. When God instituted the marriage. The husband has the rule and women don't want to hear that today. There's so many headstrong women out there. They want to be in charge. They don't want to submit to what God has designed. And that's one of the things that has destroyed marriages. You don't, you don't want to hear it. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. See, when you make that unitive joining, that one flesh, that marriage in God, that man is in charge. He's, it's not a domineering sense that, you know, it's a dictatorship, but he's the head. And God's going to recognize that. Why is that important, you say? Well, look here again. Here's another example. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ the head of the church. Why is that important? Because at the judgment... It's going to follow that pattern. Jesus talking to the woman at the well in John 4. He tells her, go call thy husband. What husband? One over here in Genesis 6. Thy husband. See it? The one that has the rule over you. There's a hierarchy here. God's established it. Jesus, who is the word, he recognizes that hierarchy. And he's telling the woman, go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husbands, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. See that? She'd been married five times. Jesus said, Those aren't your husbands. 
It's the first one. We're going to be judged for things done in the body. That was pointed out at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. You're one body. You're one flesh with that person. There's no marriage in heaven. There's no marriage. So you have to appear and he's going to do that just like he told this woman because the, the husband is the head. The only women that will appear there solo or in a sense representing themselves would be virgins or handmaidens of the Lord. Those women who have lived single, maybe widows or, you know, people who are single now that that maybe their husband did divorce them and they chose to live for God. Like the Bible says, remain unmarried. Those people, their covering is Christ. Their covering is God. But you who are married and you're in this marriage covenant, it doesn't matter if you're with your second, third, or fourth husband. It's going to go back to that first one, just like here, this pattern that Jesus has laid out for us. So you have to decide. You know, are you going to continue to live for yourself, for that marriage? That You're just going to say that, well, I want that more. That means more to me than my service to God. And that's what you're basically saying to God. And it's your decision. You can stay in it or come out of it and serve God or be reconciled to that first spouse. And people say, well, I have children now in my second marriage. Oh, well, that's right. The natural order still works. But that doesn't mean you can't take care of them still and live for God. What you're saying is, and, and Jesus said, if those things mean more to you than me, you're not worthy of me. And that's what you're telling him, that those things mean more to you than your service to God. It's your decision. The words are plain. You can't, you can't refute them. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You've heard it. You've read it. You've seen it. And you rejected it. Decision's yours.